So you can tell I'm from England straight away because I spell celiac and behaviours differently to all of you. <laughs> Who am I? So my name's Rosie. I've been at the University of Birmingham for the last four years and I studied something called disordered eating in adults with celiac disease. Now I'm in London and I'm studying long-term conditions in children with celiac disease. Concerns and anxieties around food are quite common in celiac disease and they are actually very normal. You have to watch the food you eat, you have to read food labels, you have to be vigilant, otherwise you're going to be very unwell. But for some people, this can result in fear. People get scared of food. They really, they won't eat food. They won't eat food outside their own home. They will only eat safe foods in their kitchens. This can create isolation. You suddenly, you can no longer go to birthdays where your friends are eating. You can no longer go to weddings. You eat in your own place. This can also create anxiety and depression because you're getting isolated from all of these events. And of course, an impaired quality of life. So for some people, celiac disease can create really difficult state of affairs. So my research looks at eating attitudes and behaviours in adults with celiac disease. And in particular, I look at something called disordered eating. So disordered eating sits somewhere between healthy eating patterns and clinically significant eating disorders, but they're not quite severe enough to be called an eating disorder. This includes things like emotional eating, a preoccupation with food, extreme fasting, maybe overeating sometimes, encompasses a whole range of things. And it's important to start detecting these behaviours because these behaviours are the ones that can eventually lead on to clinically significant eating disorders. Why are people with celiac disease at risk for disordered eating? So first of all, you've been struggling probably with symptoms or you might be asymptomatic for years and years and years. And finally, you get a diagnosis. And I know it could take a long time. And I know it can be a relief when you get your diagnosis. But actually, that's quite hard. You sit down, your doctor says, you know, you've got this thing called celiac disease. It's a disease. You have it. That's quite scary to hear, actually. And that's, that can create all sorts of feelings in you that might increase your risk for disordered eating. Now, before celiac disease is diagnosed, a lot of people will experience a lot of weight loss. They might be quite underweight when they finally get diagnosed. And then you may start your gluten-free diet, and all of a sudden, your intestines are recovering, you're gaining weight, which is really healthy. It's really good. That's your body recovering. But for some people, that can be quite scary and trigger disordered eating. Lots of people experience all sorts of horrible symptoms. They get stomach aches, they get vomiting, they get diarrhea, their lives are controlled by the toilet. It's really, really uncomfortable and horrible. And before you're diagnosed, you don't know that's gluten. Food makes you ill, food is bad. So you could start to just hate food in general and develop a type of disordered eating. And of course, in order to manage your gluten-free diet well, you have to read food labels, you have to watch what you eat, you have to ask questions. But when you're looking for that gluten-free uh, gluten content on those food labels, it's quite easy to start looking at the fat content of food, the sugar content, the calorie content, and you can start to focus on these too much and develop a type of disordered eating. And of course, the gluten-free diet is restrictive. You are limited in what you can eat. It's quite similar in some ways to being on a permanent diet, and that's quite a horrible feeling. So, an eating disorder already leaves people concerned about what they eat, but celiac disease adds something new. It's that concern around gluten. So, the questions I always wanted to answer was, how common is disordered eating in celiac disease? Am I just on a weird, crazy path and actually no one suffers from it? And what factors are associated with disordered eating? So I've spent four years doing all kinds of research to try and investigate this. I've done things like questionnaires, I've done interviews with people, I've actually spoken to people because I think that's extremely important. I've done, some thing, I've done some computer tasks where we actually look at how people read food labels, look at where their eye movements are looking. So we can look at whether you're looking at the fat content as well as the gluten content. And food taste tests, so I actually sit people in my lab in Birmingham and we see what kind of foods people like to eat, what kind of foods people are scared of. What our research has found is actually disordered eating is quite common in celiac disease. In adults, 15 to 21% of people were scoring above clinical cutoffs for disordered eating. Now, compared to healthy controls, people without celiac disease, it's a lot higher. Healthy controls only have 2 to 3% scoring above these cutoffs. People with other long term conditions like diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease, they are also at an increased risk of disordered eating. What's special about celiac disease? So, first of all, having any long-term condition is hard. It's not necessarily something to do with celiac disease. So, you get diagnosed, life's hard. You might be more depressed, more anxious, more stressed than people without a long-term condition. So, you might start to eat food to make you feel better, maybe. 
or maybe you stop eating because you're miserable and you've lost your appetite. But there's actually something special about celiac disease. So sometimes celiac disease is hard to manage. The gluten-free diet's really, really hard. And what we've found in our research is that following that gluten-free diet can lead to disordered eating. So some people might actually, and I have to emphasize, there's a very small proportion of people might deliberately consume gluten in order to lose weight. So they will encourage themselves to have these horrible symptoms, the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, because it will result in weight loss. And I can tell already from most of your faces, you wouldn't dream of that. <laughs> It is a minority of people, but it does happen. And those with lots of gastrointestinal symptoms just before they were diagnosed are particularly at risk for disordered eating. So then we sort of um, discovered this new type of disordered eating in celiac disease. So not all people with disordered eating want to do it to lose weight. Some people with celiac disease might develop an extreme anxiety and a sort of hypervigilance around food. Now, yes, I know you have to be careful around food. That is essential. But I'm hoping some of these quotes will really show you what I mean by this. So one person said, told me, food is the enemy. I don't let other people eat near me. I'm scared of the breadcrumbs. And actually, these concerns get more extreme than this. So I spoke to a lady a couple of months ago who said, I won't let my husband put up wallpaper in my house because I'm scared of the gluten in the wallpaper paste. Now, I'm sure most of you know, you should, wallpaper in your house should be fine as long as you're not eating that wallpaper <laughs> or licking it then you've got a whole other problem. <laughs> so we've identified three types of disordered eating and celiac disease. One's triggered by psychological distress. One's triggered by these concerns around cross-contamination. And one's all about management of the gluten-free diet and mismanaging the gluten-free diet. So I thought I'd put up some examples just to make it really clear for you. So in terms of psychological distress, these are real cases. The names aren't real, but these are real cases I've spoken to. So Sarah had lost interest in the things she used to enjoy and felt isolated. She hated her strict gluten-free diet. I'm sure a lot of you can identify with that. Whenever Sarah saw gluten-free food, she would collect it and eat it all in one go. And she used this food to make herself feel better. So what Sarah actually did, she, gluten-free Kit Kats had just come out in England. She loved Kit Kats. But so Sarah, and maybe some of you, was collecting these Kit Kats, <laughs> loved them. She'd store them in her bedroom, and then she'd go, she'd go quite long without eating because she was scared of eating outside the home. She'd get home, and she would eat eight, nine, ten packets of Kit Kats in one go. This is a lot of Kit Kats. Each packet contains, like, ten chocolate bars, I guess. So she was eating a lot, and she did this to make herself feel better. So then we had Jake. So Jake felt nauseous and tired before his diagnosis. His gluten-free diet made him feel better. But he was really worried about experiencing these symptoms again. He only liked to eat food that he had made in his own kitchen. And this was so, so extreme that he wouldn't go to his friend's birthday. And actually, he ended up not going to a wedding because of his concerns around other people preparing food. Then we got Ella. Ella was underweight before she was diagnosed. And she, put, she gained some weight when she started her gluten-free diet, which was completely healthy, nothing abnormal. She gained a couple of pounds. But she didn't like this weight change, so she started eating bread to try and make herself underweight again because one of her symptoms was vomiting. So she would eat bread to lose weight. It was, it's a little bit like you hear bulimia where people take laxatives to lose weight. A similar process. When does it become disordered eating? I have to, let me tell you this again, not everyone with celiac disease has disordered eating. It is a small minority of people. Um, and people have to have to alter their diet. Of course you do. And this only becomes a concern when sort of it really impacts your life. You're getting depressed, anxious, stressed. You get fearful. You're not eating outside the home. You're staying in your own kitchen, really miserable on your own. That's when we are particularly concerned. Now, in children, the evidence isn't that great at the moment. There's very limited evidence. There is some evidence that children with celiac disease are also at greater risk of disordered eating compared to healthy controls. And this is also associated with poor management of the gluten-free diet and psychological distress. So it looks like there's a similar picture developing in children. So how can we actually help? Now, what I always tell people is plan and prepare. You're going out shopping all day. You're going to want to eat some lunch. I'm not going to, don't go hungry all day. There are gluten-free restaurants out there. Google the ones or go to your familiar restaurant. Plan where you're going to go. And if you're not comfortable in those restaurants, pack a packed lunch. Take your own gluten-free sandwich with you. If it makes you comfortable to eat your sandwich in a restaurant with a fr your friends because that makes you feel better, then that's what you should do. Don't go hungry. Education around cross-contamination is really important. 
as well as having that confidence to talk to waiters, to talk to restaurant staff about what you can and can't eat. And support from family and friends is probably one of the best things. People who have that support tend to do better. And if concerned about yourself or your child, please do seek support from your healthcare professionals. So despite having celiac disease, we would like you all to have a well-balanced diet, uh, feel confident in asking for gluten-free foods, not feel distressed, and just live a good, normal life with the caveat that it's gluten-free. One last time, the majority of people with celiac do not have an eating disorder or disordered eating. It is only a few people. Thank you. Thank you.